Thank you. Please be seated. Died a couple times. Now we hear a lot of talk about viruses in our day. We're going to talk about computer viruses. You have a bit of relief? Maybe. There's a government economist virus. This is noted as follows. Nothing works, but all your diagnostic software says everything is fine. There's a new world order virus. It's probably harmless, but it makes a lot of people mad just thinking about it. The federal bureaucrat virus. It divides your hard drive into hundreds of little units, each of which do practically nothing, but all of which claim to be the most important part of the computer. There's the Paul Revere virus. This revolutionary virus does not horse around. It warns you of impending hard disk attack. If you're using a hard line, landline, you get one warning. If you're using the Wi-Fi, you get two warnings. But it just tells you your impending doom is coming. Then there's the politically correct virus. Never calls itself a virus, but instead refers to itself as an electronic microorganism. Aren't you glad we have some other kind of virus to relax over? Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray, Lord, that we would stop for just a moment. Be thankful for you as our Savior, our great God, one who's coming again, whose hope is the hope of this world. Bless us now this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now there was a man who went into a pet shop to buy a parrot. The shop owner points to three identical looking parrots on perches and he says to him, the parrot on the left costs five hundred dollars. Why does the parrot cost so much? asked the first man. The owner says, well the parrot knows how to use a computer. The man then asks about the next parrot to be told that this one costs one thousand dollars. Because it can do everything the other parrot can do plus it knows how to use the computer system. Naturally, the increase in price startled the man just about to ask about the third parrot. And he says, what does that parrot cost? The fellow said, $2,000. Well, he had to ask a question. And he says, what can it do? And the owner replied to him, To be honest, I have never seen it do a thing. But the other two call him boss. <laughs> well, folks, we know who the boss is. It's the Lord. He's in heaven. He's on the throne. He's in control. We look at the word of God and we stop and we realize that God has not made a mistake along the way. When he's given us a promise, he's fulfilled it. When he's told us something's going to come to pass, and it has come to pass, it's been to the letter. You know, I thank the Lord. We have a Lord that is truly in control. Sometimes we tend to forget that he tells us that there's some things that are going to take place in the future. He's in control. We should remember that. Man may be loose, be on the run, think he's on top of everything, but I have news for him. 
God's going to pull them up short one day. And we're going to notice that. Well, there's a portion of a verse here that I want us to notice. And uh, it relates to Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great prince of preachers in the 1800s in London. And uh, Spurgeon had this experience. He had an atheist that lived close in the vicinity of his home. And this fellow was very ugly to anybody that held to the Bible. Well, Mr. Spurgeon asked the Lord one day to direct him in what he should read for the morning devotions. And then he seemed strongly impressed to read the book of Joel and in its entirety. And he went through and read the whole book. But when he came to Joel chapter 3, he read the third verse. It says, and he sold the girl for wine. Whereupon Spurgeon checked his concordance to see how many times the word girl occurred. Big surprise. Once. You don't have to look any further then, do you? So he found it once. And to his great surprise, he moved on. And a little later, he thought he'd take a walk. So he walked about a block and a half from the house. And there was the atheist's house. He went up to the door. He knocked. The atheist growled. Well, what do you want? Spurgeon said, I would like to read the Bible to you. The atheist began his usual abuse, then suddenly stopped and said, Will you tell me how often the word girl is in the Bible? Mr. Spurgeon answered, Once. The atheist then said, tell me where it is found and I will let you in. Spurgeon replied, Joel 3, verse 3. The atheist then said, tell me before I let you in, how did you know it? Spurgeon told him about the story that had transpired two hours before. He went in, he sat down with a man about an hour and a half, and at that point in time he had trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Folks, God's in the saving business. Wouldn't it be something if some of the leaders in our nation that are so outspoken, so against our Savior would come to know Jesus Christ? You just pick a place, Congress, Senate, the Governor's Mansion, the Senate over in, the, in at the Denver, the House, huh? Wouldn't it be great if God would save some folks? You think about it. Uh, God called home Charles Colson. Who knows? Maybe Roger Stone will replace him. Huh? Unthinkable? No. God's a God of the impossible. And he's in the saving business. In our passage before us today, we notice that God is going to gather these folks together in a great place. It's the valley of decision. I wish we could take a trip to Israel. Quick one. And go to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem forms kind of the fulcrum, the, the center point of our passage of Scripture. Because there is between the Mount of Olives and the adjoining mountain in Jerusalem there, a valley. It's very narrow. But it has a spot there. It's called Hinnom. It's referred to elsewhere in Scripture, a topic. We know it as hell. It was the garbage dump. But that very area opens up going north into a wide open valley. My friend, it's the general's dream of a battlefield. But guess what? God says, I'm going to use it. 
You know, I wish that folks would stop and consider that the day in which we live is in some ways exciting. Some ways it takes the very breath out of you. You know, it hasn't been that long since uh, we, I read in passing how Russia was using planes in Syria. No, they weren't having somebody else fly them. They were flying them in Syria. Now, some folks believe that Gog and Magog, that focuses out of Moscow. See, the Russians have been pretty astute about staying out of the Middle East. You know, they, they got their fingers in the pie. They're pushing people around, but they stay out of it. They didn't there. You know, the interesting thing about Syria is that uh, Damascus is the oldest city on earth. You don't find an older one. But you know what the prophets tell us about Damascus? In the end times, she will be destroyed. If you haven't seen it, bring up Damascus. Take a look. The dictator of Syria has been told, you should resign and leave. Because it showed a picture of Damascus. It is rubble. Hmm? Is God knocking at the door? Here this last week, what was in the news? Netanyahu goes to the Arabs down there. And what does he make? He makes peace. You know, folks, what I think is this. It would be very smart and intelligent for the Arabs to make peace with Israel. Because anytime they go to war, they lose. Do you get me? They lose. They lose big time. They lose when they shouldn't lose. I think God's on their side. No, they need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep in mind, there are Jewish believers in Israel that love God, want to serve Him. Want to see their countrymen saved. God is truly on the throne. But we live in a day and time when little indicators pop up. Say, hey, something's going on. Now we want to look at our passage today. And I want you to realize that uh, God is simply fulfilling what he says that he'll do. In the book of Deuteronomy... Chapter 30 and verse 3, the Lord says there, Then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. He's talking to Israel. And he's saying, I'm going to put you in captivity. I'm going to send you into dispersion into the world. Now that saw its finale under the Romans. They emptied Israel of any Jewish people. They destroyed the land. By 130 A.D., there were no Jews there. But God promises them here. He says, I will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Now, by the way, Let's not forget that there are more Jews in New York City than there are in Israel. There are more Jews in Sao Paulo, Brazil than there are in Israel. That's just two places in the Americas. Folks, but God's on the throne. And He promised them here, I'm going to bring you back. Well,
Well, we see here in verses 2 and 12 that uh, there's a reckoning of justice that's going to take place. We hear a lot about justice. Well, God's going to keep it. He's going to make it right. And uh, notice in verse 2 it says, And I will also gather all nations and will put them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Folks, the nation of Israel is God's inheritance. Aren't you glad that in Jesus Christ, you and I are joint heirs with Jesus Christ? That's a blessing. We're, we're in, part of an inheritance. I want you to remember that God's inheritance is His people. And He's not going to let go what's happened to them. They have been persecuted through the ages. And yet God says, I will bless you. I will bring you back. Now the word Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges. We have folks hollering for social justice. I trust you picked up as we read through the passage earlier that uh, it's talking about selling people. What is that? It's slavery. See, God sees it as being wrong. The founders of our nation saw it as something that was wrong. You know, God's going to bring justice. And He'll gather them together here. As a matter of fact, in Zechariah 14.4, it says this about when the Lord will come back and His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. This will be at His second coming to the earth. That that mountain is going to split. Matter of fact, geologists tell us that there is a fault in that mountain. Now, the San Andreas fault may split today. I don't know. But I know one thing. When Jesus comes back, that one in Jerusalem is going to split. And it may well change the topography in the land to a degree. In Zechariah 14.4, it says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now, I might clarify a point, just to try to help you a little. The Mount of Olives is about 8,800 feet above sea level. So we're not talking about a 14,000 footer in Colorado. Alright? But I assure you, when that mountain splits, it's going to make a big difference. And it's going to open up. And we're told what's going to take place here. And uh, here in verses 4 through 8, uh, Joel speaks directly in that he talks about the Phoenicians. That's Tyre and Sidon. Those were the, uh, the Wall Street of the day. They took care of the money. What was traded? Commerce. He mentions the Greeks. The Ionians. What was one of the things that they dealt in? Slaves. By the way, Scripture doesn't know of just one color for slaves. It's anybody that's been picked up and hauled off. The conqueror had his feast. Thing is, in verses 7 through 8, let's notice something. Maybe it'll help bolster our strength a little bit. 
He says here, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. See, they'd taken some of the Jewish folks into slavery and sold them. And the Lord says, you wait. They are going to ascend over you. And then you will experience the brunt of what's to come. Folks, let's realize our Lord sits on the throne. He's in control. He doesn't make a mistake. His grace is sufficient for us. He will right the wrong. He will set the course straight. If we were wondering what degree he would take, just look at our passage. It takes us back. This isn't a small thing. This is a big thing. And in verse 8 he goes on, And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans to be a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. The Sabaeans, folks, are the Arabs. One of the greatest marketeers of slavery have been the Arabs. Far greater than anyone in the Americas. But we see here that the Lord says, hey, I'm going to turn it back on them. And uh, I will bring about this requisition of justice. And uh, there will be a reckoning of that justice. Which he makes very clear here. But let's notice next, he has a requisition of the participants in verse 9. And he, the God gives some commands. He says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. And your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Anybody notice something peculiar? How do we usually see that? What does the Lord tell us? The lamb's going to sit down beside the lion. The, the weapons are going to be beat into what? Plowshares. Pruning hook is a scythe. Think of a little pruning hook. It's not quite it. That's a big puppy reaches in and you get the harvest he says create the weapons folks aren't you glad the others there and every Christmas we're reminded of the Prince of Peace and what he's going to bring see at the end of an age God always brings judgment The first real judgment we saw was probably in the Garden of Eden and seemed pretty quiet. God simply expelled the two participants, said, you've been evicted. Then man builds up probably billions in this, on this earth. We don't know for certain how many. Then he sends a flood, that's judgment. I'm glad the cross is in there, folks. That's a judgment. That's amazing. Jesus died for our sins. And in time, that, that inner working of God's goodness and His grace transformed the Roman Empire. No, it wasn't immediate, but it took place. It changed things. The Reformation rolled around and folks, that changed the world again. And now it would appear we're heading maybe for another time. God says, I have it in hand, don't fret. I'll make it right, I'm not done. Because my son's going to come back and reign and rule. And he calls to those participants to gather together. 
And uh, we've got to remember, as you say, well, why is God going to do this to all the nations? Well, it's because of their great wickedness. Why did God destroy the participants in the land of Israel when Israel went in to conquer the land? Because of their wickedness. Someone says, oh, Pastor, they couldn't be that bad. You wouldn't want to read what they did in mixed company. Of course, I'm not sure we want to read the newspaper today. Huh? But they're ripe for judgment. They've gone against God's moral code. What about us? Where have we been slowly pushed? We've been pushed to the murder of millions. And it pales in the face when we think of what Hitler did to the Jews. And I'm not degrading or defrauding what was done there because that was wrong. And you talk about God bringing swift judgment. The Third Reich turned into a one decade dead end. So much for socialism, folks. One, a dead end. Doesn't work. But we see here it's because of their evil. And he's going to bring this innumerable host together where? To the valley of decision. You and I face a decision. We need to plant our flag, and unfurl it, and let it fly for Jesus Christ. We need to speak more about Jesus. Use his name. Let people know, hey, God's been good to me. You say, but some people might not like that. They won't like this either. But it's too late. Now there's a moment of time. Now there's a window of grace. And they don't see it. They see this as the evil of evils. When in fact, it's the good life. Huh? So let's, let's make sure we stand. Let's pray. Let's ask God to take what's going on around us and end it. Put a stop to it. There are those that I think have their eyes open and they see exactly what's going on. You think about it. You have everybody's faceless. You watch how they act in Walmart. You can't tell if their mouth's open or not. You can't tell if they're happy. They're isolated. God wants us to show what we are where we stand. Now I think we as believers ought to be those that care about others, their welfare, their goodness. We ought to treat them right. We want to be treated likewise. Seems to me like there's a bit too much going on when you see people driving down the road and they got a mask on and you don't even see the dog in there with them. Something's wrong, folks. You're out in the open air. We've got to be able to breathe and see and smile and enjoy the feel of the sun when it's out. But folks, let's remember God's grace is abounding. And I want you to remember very briefly, and I don't have time to go into detail on it, but in 1948... There was the Arab-Israeli war. The Arabs should have won. They didn't. Israel did. You have a history somewhat like another little nation I know of. Decided they'd become a nation and found themselves at war with the greatest power on earth. 
And they conquered. Israel conquers. It was the Suez Canal in 1958. 56, excuse me. That involved Israel. They won. <laughs> it was the Six Day War in 1967. Let me tell you something, folks. We couldn't even muster our folks and get them together and get them ready to move. These, they wrapped it up. You say, why? Because God. Wish I had access to some of the reports that we had from the 67 war. It was amazing what the, what the Arabs were telling them. It's like a fairy tale. But they conquered. Then there was the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Man, talk about catching Israel totally out of perspective. They waited to attack until it was that great Sabbath day. A holy day. And the Arabs attacked. And they lost. Folks, the same God that's on the side of Israel is on our side. Let's take it to heart. Let's realize His truths go on. When He says, I'm going to bring this to pass, we can trust Him. He'll take care of us. He's not forsaken a one of us. You know, go to my error. The former Prime Minister of Israel said this, We Jews have a secret weapon in our struggle with the Arabs. We have no place to go. That's their home. My friend, I'm glad we can go to the throne of grace. We can ask God. And He'll provide for us and help us. You know, in Psalm 46, 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He says in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Folks, let's remember, prophecy is certain. Promises of God are life sustaining. They're not going to fail. The call of God to salvation is sure. And I'm glad He holds His hands out and says, Come unto me. Trust Him. <clears throat> Jesus has come. I'll take your burden, I'll take your sin. And if we call upon God, He's. Salvation is sure. But my friend, let's remember the decision's ours. Make it for him. Where does judgment begin? At the household of God. That's where it begins. It begins with us, not with them. With us. Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your assuring Word. Lord, the assurance that You are in control, the assurance that You will care for Your nation Israel, for the assurance of knowing that You will take care of us as Your children of God. We ask You, Lord, to guide us. May we be looking to You prayerfully, persistently, and Lord, if there be one here that does not know you, we pray, Lord, that today would be the day that they would trust you. Bless them now. In your name we pray. Amen. If you will, let's stand and turn.